Hello, Umberto. Uh, this is uh, Ken Borelli with the Italian American Heritage Foundation, and we're getting ready for an amazing culinary experience uh, with uh, Chef Umberto Pava of Vinsanto in Willow Glen, that will San be Jose. Me. <laughs> <laughs> and also Il Sogno, which we've had many Cenaforte at. Uh, right now, uh, he is concentrating his efforts on Vinsanto, which is a premier Italian restaurant in the heart of Willow Glen. But prior to this, uh, Umberto was uh, the chef at uh, Il Fornaio by the in the St. Clair Hotel. And I also found out he was also a key chef in, uh, at Tutto Mare in San Diego. He's also a graduate of the San Pellegrino Hotel School. It's also where the famous San Pellegrino waters are located. So what we do at this class, this is a culinary class, is we're gonna have a wine pairing with each of the antipasto that uh, Umberto will be teaching us. And uh, the wine uh, maitre d' for tonight will be Jason Chietti of uh, uh, Siena Imports. And he will pair and talk about each of the wine that Umberto will be preparing as antipasto. Umberto, what are we gonna have? Good evening, everybody. Like I said, my name is Umberto Pala, and the chef and owner of Santo. We've been here for 14 years now. No. 14 that's long years. Oh, that's too long. Uh, as you can see, I'm, I'm 17 years old. <laughs> and then age very quick. Uh, we finally have reopened the indoor dining a couple of weeks ago. We built two beautiful patios for outdoor dining. I love and it. I and love we didn't have before. Um, I'm excited to do this class for you guys. Uh, tonight we're going to feature some small plates, appetizer, uh, refreshing salad, um, something that you can easily make at home, something that uh, you can use as a finger food, as a starter. Some dishes can be made a little bit bigger uh, and be served also as a main course. So the sequence tonight of our, our um, dishes are going to be gamberi all'anice, that is a, a shrimp dish that is uh, made with sambuca. An uh, old friend of mine, an old friend chef, teached me that dish uh, over 20 years ago. <laughs> I modified a little bit, it was a French version, I modified it to an Italian version. After that, we're gonna have uh, like a fried pizza dough called panzotti fritti. After that, we're gonna have a vegetarian dish, uh, a portobello mushroom, bread and Milanese style, and served with a garlic aioli. Then we're gonna clean our palate with an insalata rossa, beautiful season for it. Three main ingredients, tomato, watermelon, and strawberry. The all three almost at the peak of the season right now. Amazing. After that, we're gonna do like a rotolino di prosciutto. It's a asparagus, ham, and Swiss cheese wrapped in puff pastry. Then two more course. One is gonna be our famous uh, meatball with our, our uh, tomato sauce, award winner of the Boston sauce in uh, Little Italy. And the last dish is gonna be a uh, different version of uh, what we have in Armenia that is our peachy with cinghiale that is the main course uh, is a pasta dish but tonight we're going to use the same wild boar we're going to use it uh, as a bruschetta so with a grilled bread hope you guys enjoy you're going to learn something i open for any question have fun thank you wow i think uh I don't know if they're going to learn. I am, but I don't know if I'm going to do it. I think I'd rather come to Vinsanto. <laughs> but it is, it's going to be an amazing uh, class, and I'm very excited. Yeah, thank, thank you, you Umberto, for... Thank you, Ken, for organizing. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jason. Here. Mm -hmm. uh, then we have wines from, you know, the Alps, the Dolomites, uh, the volcanic soils of uh, Sardinia, I mean, sorry, Sicily. So uh, every soil is present, every grape is present, so it never gets boring. Um, I know umberto has got an incredible menu paired for these wines, so uh, I hope the wines stand up to the food. That's our goal. Um, and if you guys have any questions, please feel free to ask, because we like to talk about wine. That's my job. Pizza. <laughs> Uh, so tonight we're gonna start with some. Uh, we're gonna do all appetizer. Uh, you have, uh, like you said, a recipe right in front of you. They're actually in order of what we're gonna cook and what I'm gonna cook. Once so, uh, we're gonna be done cooking. Jason will and 
uh, Kevin and Leo will pour the wine for you. He's gonna talk the wine. He's gonna talk to you about the wine. Once he's almost done talking the wine, the same dish that I just cooked, I'm gonna come out of the kitchen and you're all gonna have the same thing. So we're gonna start tonight uh, with a dish. Uh, actually, a French chef teach me this dish. Uh, Long time ago, 25 years ago. <laughs> 25 years ago, and uh, in France they use a Pernod, uh, that is uh, anise liqueur. Uh, I switch out the recipe a little bit, and I use some buka, and it's very similar. Um, it's a nice starter. Uh, you can also substitute the, the small shrimp that I'm using as an appetizer with a big, big shrimp, and I use it as a main course. Uh, that's what he used to do, and I switch it up and made this a little bit smaller and I use it as an appetizer. So we start with a hot pan right here. I'm gonna add a little bit of oil and some butter. And the shrimp right here, then I'm gonna dust it off with flour and set it aside here. Then I have some garlic right here. Then I'm going to smash up. And then I'm going to chop. Once the butter is melted, I'm going to add the garlic and let it brown a little bit. The gamberi, gamberi al lunch, the very first recipe on your book. So I like to dust uh, the, the flour on the shrimp. You can do also without the flour. Um, I find out if I put a little bit of flour and uh, the meat or the fish, you always keep a little bit of moisture on it. Once the garlic is brown, I add the shrimp. We're gonna stir it, stir it. A little bit of salt, pepper, I'm gonna uh, shear, shear the shrimp on both sides. <laughs> Oh, now the farm stuff. Now we're gonna put a little bit of sambuca. Be careful on your clothes. It's wood, right? So we're gonna get the sambuca to reduce the alcohol out. Once the flame is done. We add a little bit of white wine just to finish the cook. The shrimp. Once it evaporated, we're going to add a little bit of the cream. Then I'm going to have a ripe tomato right here. They're gonna slice it up and then dice it. <laughs> and I'm gonna add the tomato. The bit of lemon juice. Lemon juice. Now we're gonna let reduce the cream until it's fairly thick. Once the cream it got thick, that's, then you wanna shut off the fire. Then you add the fresh herb, then I usually don't cut with a knife, but I just break it out with my hand. You don't want to cut the basil with your knife because it's oxidated and become black. 
Mm -hmm. You always want to put any fresh air that you use in any food, you always want to put at the end when they're off fire, because otherwise if they get too much heat, they're going to bring out the bitterness of the herb. Then I'm going to add a little bit more butter at the very, very end, without fire, and then we're going to toss them. So what the butter is going to do at the end without the fire, they're going to melt very slow, and going to, in Italian they call it mantecare, you use it a lot, the technique for risotto. Uh, pretty much bring the cream out of the butter and kick the sauce up. Umberto, is this a dish that comes from Northern Italy? Like I say, it's a French dish. Then I uh, revisited my own style, and it was fairly popular, especially when I was down in San Diego. Because they use cream and butter. Correct. And then we got the difference. So the prima tappa, the first stop tonight, is in Friuli. And the wine, very simple, is Friulano. So Friulano means the white grape from Friuli. Um, a little background history. In Friuli, they used to call it Tokai. Unfortunately, uh, they uh, could not call it Tokai anymore because there's a Hungarian wine named Tokai. So this is a native uh, grape of the region. So it, it became known as Friulano. And Friulano, uh, we thought would be a great pairing because in the Laguna Veneziana, like the Laguna, the Adriatic, that part of the sea right there, this is typically paired with, uh, with shrimp, uh, shellfish, this is more like a like a finger food, like a street food. Depends where you go in Italy, and it varies the size or what's inside, and also the name. They call it panzerotti, panzotti, calzone, fritto, pizza fritta, depends really where you're going in Italy. Um, so I'm going to make a very simple version, and I'm gonna do, we're going to make it small so we use it as a finger for an appetizer. Uh, we start with very simple, so pretty much like a, a recipe for a pizza dough. I'm going to start with flour, put a hole in the middle. No measurement, huh? Not really? <laughs> <laughs> a little salt. Olive oil. No, no. I got uh, a little dry yeast and water. So in this case, I prefer always to use cold water unless I'm in a hurry. Uh, so cold water, uh, slow the, uh, the raise of the dough. They take a little bit longer, but you're also gonna have a, a, a better product at the end. If you're in a little hurry, just put a little bit of warm water and cut about half of the time on the raise. You can even see it in the store or any of my provision. Are you using Italian olive oil? Or? Yes. So I put uh, the yeast and the water in it, in the middle of the dough, and then from the inside up, we incorporate the flour in it. Now what kind of flour are you using? Oh, yeah, basic, basic flour, Mondaco flour, yeah. Again, depends what you use it for. I mean, if you do bread or a, or a pizza, like, Especially if you don't have a wood fire oven or anything like that. Or. No, no, white flour. All purpose? All purpose. We want to work, I mean, this is a small. But so I'm gonna work it. You wanna work it with both your hand. So you pretty much you're gonna wrap the dough in and then push it down with the palm on your hand. Do it again until all the flour is absorbed. 
I don't want to stay here for two hours, so I'm going to have a very quick version. <laughs> So once uh, they, they, you can feel the dough and absorb all the flour and all the water, you want to put it in a bowl and cover with plastic wrap. So you put it in a semi-warm, you want to put it maybe on top of there, you have an oven on, under, under your stove, maybe on top of the stove, not too close where the heat come out, but you know, in the middle of the stove, so you get a little bit of heat, but not too much. You also help the raise. And then once you double the side, you grab it and we make pretty much when you raise it, you're gonna come up. Perfect. Okay, once the door raise, what do you wanna do? You wanna get a little bit of flour on the table again and then we're going to open up the door almost like a pizza you try to make it as less thin as you, you can but be careful when you do that because you don't want to make it too thin because you don't want the dough to break once you start frying like I just did <laughs> Okay, and here, like I said, I did a, a simple version with just tomato and mozzarella. Uh, where I'm from, they put that. They put they don't put any tomato inside. Uh, we put like a, like a Swiss cheese and ham or a ricotta and mushroom. Um, <coughs> So there'll be a mozzarella inside. And we're gonna close it up. It's like a cassone, correct. And I usually grab a fork. It's like an empanada, kind of. I usually do it with a fork like that. You can also, uh, I usually do it with a fork. So you close it. You can put a little bit of water on the edge to close it. They also another technique where you fold it, and then you fold it on top, then you fold it on top, then you fold it on top, you keep going around. You know, it's really up to you. There's different ways to, sh I like very simple, little bit of water for, and usually stay, you want it to get, the whole temperature around 350. Uh, we use a deep fry usually at home. If you don't have a deep fry, the best way to do it, I just put a little flour in it. When the flour evaporates very quick, and the oil is ready, I lower it down a little bit, and then I put it in. Wow. <laughs> he makes it look so easy, you know. Yes, <laughs> pretty. <laughs> Get somebody on the roof uh, fixing the fridge. Yeah. <laughs> then we turn it around. <laughs> this, uh, this dough is good. You can make bread with it. You can make a uh, pizza, like baked pizza. You can bake this too. I like a fry, so you can see. <laughs> uh, you can make pizza. Uh, you can make sweet with it. You add a little bit of sugar in the dough. You make a little bowl and let it rise, and then you fry it like that. Uh, when you finish it, put in some sugar and cinnamon. Uh, in Mexico, they call it buñuelos. Uh, in Italian, we call it fritelle. Depends, on, again, where you're going. There is all the same stuff. <laughs> Water, flour, and yeast. Have you ever air fried? Air fried. Air fryer? Air fryer. Air fryer? No. <laughs> You've been knocked in, and then you put a, a coat of sugar and cinnamon. I think you did. I think you did.
Tomato, marinara sauce, and mozzarella. So now tonight, guys, uh, we're shifting gears. We're going from northeastern Italy down to Rome, to the capital. Just south of Rome is an area called the Agro Pontino Valley. And uh, it's actually a place where the Romans made wine, but for a long time, basically, uh, there was only tomatoes. The agriculture was tomatoes, watermelon, just agriculture, no, no vineyards anymore. Um, until this family, the Sartarelli family, they had nine uh, stores in Rome for distribution of olive oil and wine. They invested in the Agropontino Valley because they wanted to start doing viticulture there again because they had an idea that there was viticulture here happening at some time. As soon as they started, uh, they figured, well, they said, first of all, what are we going to plant? Because in Rome, there really isn't a culture for, for making like quality wines. Everybody knows Frascati. Frascati yeah. is the table wine of Rome. But the Frascati is a quaffing wine. It's something for people to drink in the summertime when it's so hot the Romans don't stay in Rome. They go to the seaside. Rome becomes a ghost town with tourists during the summertime. So Frascati has always been the wine people knew about. But one of the grapes in Frascati is called Bellone. Bello is means from looking. Bellone is an olive. They're talking about me. Bello is Bello and Bello. They're synonyms, right? So, so, so they go to the Agropontino Valley. They start to uh, plant 60 different grape varietals because they don't know what grows well there. Frascati is a blend of about 14 grapes. Uh, the other red grapes there, there really aren't too many. A little bit of Sangiovese. So they go into this 20 years, starts in 1980, ends in the year 2000, and they start testing varietals. Um, one of the things they tried was this grape called Bellone that was in Frascati, but it was always part of the blend. And they figured out, okay, this is the backbone of Frascati. This is what gives its structure. And so going back to the soil, we were talking about the soil that came down from the uh, the uh, Dolomites before, this soil is sandy soil. So this grape Bellone grows really well in sandy soil, and it is kind of the indigenous grape of the region. And so the Santinelli family started identifying these areas and grapes they wanted to grow, but as soon as they would start to plant a vineyard, they would find Roman uh, artifacts. And so they uncovered a city called Satrico. It's a village that is actually a pre-Roman city. It's right in the in the winery, on the vineyards. They had to close off a certain area of the vineyards. And so if you do go to the Agro Platino Valley, you can visit Gisada Gidio. There's a restaurant called Satrico there. Uh, and you can see this whole city. And then you can see this, you know, all the different grapes they grow in this area. So we were talking about the name too, Casana del Giglio means the house of the lily. So this area was uh, swampland, so there's a lot of lilies on the swampland, and so that's kind of where the, this uh, villa got its name. But this wine is called Bellone. Ah, uh, the Bellone. So this wine? Yeah. Um, it's, it's uh, right now we're going to be changing vintages, so there's in the state of California, there's probably only 80 cases left, you know, but um, um, it's pretty well available, you know. Yeah. Is it? There's another wine from that region, S.S. S.S. is from Monte Fiascone, and that is li literally on the border of Lazio and Umbria. Okay. And the reason why that wine got its name was because the, when the Pope would travel from Rome to where he would summer, he would have a herald, somebody going down the road before them and go into all the different pubs and, you know, little wine and, and taste the wine. And when he found the place that had good food, good wine, he would write S, S, S on it, which means this place, this place, this place. So it was a way. Is the same grape or different grape? That's different grapes. The S, 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 I think, is... Uh, Malvasia and uh, um, and Piano blend. Right. This is a mono varietal. So another thing that we did is we visited two different regions and we visited and we also are tasting a varietal that is not blended with other grapes. Oh, okay. Usually put a little bit of salt and pepper on that. I'm gonna put a little bit of more cream or water. Yeah.
Depends how thick you want your uh, your crust. A lot of people they go back in the flour, then back in the eggs. I like it, mine not too thick. So from the egg, I go in the breadcrumb. Here I got the garlic. Put it right here. I got a porcini ready right here, gonna set that aside for a second. Also when you bread, when you do this kind of process, a lot of people dig in with two hands, and you got two hands like this. So grab your left hand or your right hand, whatever, you put it in your back like this, and you use only one hand. So if anything else happens in the kitchen, you always have your left hand. Clean, to go, ready to go. Only one hand on it. <laughs> now we're going to do the aioli very quick. So I already uh, roast the garlic. It's going to be brown and soft right now. So I'm going to smash the garlic at the bottom first. <laughs> Now what's this called again? Aioli. Aioli. So you don't want to add the mayo when the garlic is hot, otherwise the egg is going to cook and separate it from the oil. But we're going to do something. So if you have it like separated on the bowl and leave the garlic, you would cool uh, um, down quicker. Then I'm going to add a little bit of mayo. 
Mayonnaise. I use the chipotle because it's not super spicy. Thank you. But I also give it like a smoky flavor that I like. And it was pretty popular the last few years. So in this case, I, I just use a little tiny bit. I understand those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mostly just the juice, just to give it a little bit of flavor. Um, we also do something very similar on this and uh, put sriracha sauce on it. Wait, that's what I saw. Huh? I thought I saw sriracha. No. I don't know. You can use sriracha with it. So now the sauce is ready. I'm going to fry the portobello mushroom very quick. Again, uh, I just fry it. This is not deep fry. I simulated the deep fry here. I just fry it. So then uh, to decorate, and then you can use these also for desserts or stuff like that. You get a uh, paper. You got it, get in a triangle like this. Uh, I actually gonna use it as a sack of posh, like a pastry bag. So you got a triangle, a perfect triangle. And then you go from one corner to that corner. And then you go down to the other corner. That's why I just leave, lose my ass. <laughs> so we're going to turn the portobello. And this portobello like that, you can use it as a uh, appetizer. You can put it on, slice it up and put it on top of a salad. Uh, I used to put it on top of a filet mignon. It's like a, so it looks like a mushroom. Uh, you can leave it like that and put a little balsamic reduction on it. On this case, like I say, we're going to do it the IOD. Oh! Like 
power Okay, going to the next side, the uh, salad. And uh, we have it actually in the restaurant, and it's one of the most popular salads, especially in the summertime. It's called rosa salad, I mean red salad. Obviously, you find out the ingredients, you know the reason. <laughs> um, beautiful season now for the salad, the strawberry, the peach. The watermelon and the tomato are getting to the peak right now. I, I like it to don't have it too ripe because you don't want it too mushy, uh, too juicy or too mushy. Um, also, uh, a different variant if you have a, like a finger food party at your house, uh, you can cut all the vegetable, all the fruit in a nice square, big square and put it in a stick, in a toothpick, a big toothpick or a skewer, and, and then serve it as a finger food. So, when I start, I start to cut the fruit first. And the strawberries. Sorry about that. We decided to do a late model. So you're sticking with the you are going to try to cut the fruit almost all of the same size. Obviously, strawberry has different shape than tomato, but as long as you have the same, kind of like the same chunk size. Cocomero. Anguria or cocomero? Okay, now I got all the fruit. And then we do, we do two thirds of acidity. I mean, one third of acidity and two thirds of oil. So yes. when the acidity is a citrus, like lemon, orange, lime, or grapefruit, it becomes a citronette. It's okay. a French word. Citron from citrus, and citronette is a sauce with citrus. If is uh, the acidity is vinegar, balsamic by vinegar and vinegar is a vinegar. Very often, people confuse lemon vinaigrette. Uh, is a lemon, then it's a citronette, it's not vinegar. Um, when you start a dressing, like a salad dressing, uh, with base of vinegar or, or lemon or orange, you want to start it always with the salt and the acidity, because what it does, the salt, the, the acidity melts the salt. If you would put the salt and the oil next, then they, they wouldn't melt. Citrus first. Okay, you mix it a little bit until you can see that the, the salt is incorporated in the in the juice. Then a little secret, if I found it, you want to put a little bit of mustard. It can be grain mustard like I use, regular mustard, uh, some people put a little bit of mayo on it. Uh, the very simple result, it will not separate when if you serve it right away. And if it's separate and you emulsion it again, you mix it again, you want to keep it together again. I mean, don't worry, it's like mixing water and, and oil, they don't mix. <laughs> so the master, the emulsifies for Ah, uh, no, prepare master. Yeah, it can be a yellow master, gray master, what, anything, really. You can eat it, a uh, friend of mine used to use mayo too. He just really what he does, he try, he keep together the oil and, and the acidity. 
So once the master is mixed with the salt and pepper, then it's it like start putting the oil in it. And you keep mixing it until it's pretty much almost creamy. Uh, I grew up the whole way, so we do it with the whisk because we do a big batch. If you have a little bottle, a little squeezy bottle, you put it in there, salt, and, uh, ju and the juice first, and the acidity first, mix it up a little bit, put the oil in it, and then shake it, then we'll do it. Then you put it back away, and you have it all, every time. <laughs> Drop the dressing on top there. I like only basil. But on the recipe, as you can see, I also put, then it's nice if you want to put some uh, mint. I'm not a big fan of mint. Uh, cilantro can be good too. No big fan of cilantro either. I keep it very simple. I like cilantro better than mint. Toss it a little bit. <laughs> And then one thing that I can put in your in your recipe book, uh, if you want, and if you like it. Sangiovese is the name of the grape. It's also like Pinot Grigio, the most grown grape in Italy. It's interesting, we were talking earlier about a lot of Italian names are the same, different names for the same thing. So Sangiovese, the name Sangiovese is actually Sangue di Giove. It comes from Latin. Sangue means blood. Giove is Jupiter. So the blood of Jupiter. Oh, you're just being made up. Oh. I didn't make this up. <laughs> I did not make this up. You can't make that up. You know? Um, I didn't know that. You didn't know that? Here's another one. You know Monte Pucciano d'Abruzzo? Everybody knows Monte Pucciano. You see that? San Giovese and Chianti everywhere. Genetically, they say Monte Pucciano d'Abruzzo and San Giovese are the same grade. So you can see how it goes from Tuscany to Puglia to Abruzzo to Emilia Romagna to the whole center of Italy where the Etruscans were, which is why Tuscany is named Toscana. The Etruscans cultivated Sangiovese, so wherever they went, they brought Sangiovese with them. Some of that. Um, and Sangiovese is one of those wines that, like this one, it's very simple. It goes with fruit, it goes with a lighter meal. And you can have Brunello di Montalcino, which is a wine that takes five years to make, that is the most full-bodied form of Sangiovese. So Sangiovese has many different shapes and sizes, but it is one of the most, it is the most planted grape varietal in Italy, so. Jason. Yes. Uh, we have a salad here. Right. And you serve Sangiovese. How come a red wine with this salad? Well, I think what Umberto was saying, you have the feta here or pecorino. So that typically, for me, always goes with a red wine in general, you know. Okay, but you do have, like, the freshness of the, um, the, uh, the watermelon and then the basil. You could go with the white wine here as well. Um, yeah. But for me, a, a lighter red like this, it works really well too. You know, I have a lot of, a lot of places I worked at too where like, people were like, we don't drink white wine, we own like red wine. So people would say, I'm having salmon, what well, red wine would you drink with salmon? And I would say, well, definitely not a Cabernet or a Zinfandel, but like a Pinot Noir, or we're gonna taste a Monica di Sardinia next, or maybe even like a Sangiovese that doesn't have oak on it. Typically, oak doesn't go well with fish, you know, in general. You know, just off the, you know, as, as rule of thumb. But, I mean, I guess and to me also, I, I was saying earlier that if I like a wine and you don't like a wine, that is totally fine. I mean, everybody has their own opinion. 
art is different for everybody, right? So, you know, that's the main focus, I think, for Monte Fulciano, the Abruzzi, Monte Fulciano, the other one. So that's Vino Nobile, right? Vino so Nobile. What's the difference? The alcohol, that's a flavor, great question. everybody battles over that. So the difference and you pay more for the other one. Vino Nobile, okay. So Vino this, is a, Nobile. this is going to be a little bit of a long-winded story, so why you guys eat, this is, I'll tell you what it is. Well, so, I wanted to the so, <laughs> Montepulciano um, is a town in Tuscany. I, my family is about 20 minutes away from there, so growing up I spent, I still spend a lot of time there. When I, go to, I love Montepulciano. It's this beautiful hill town. If you've never been to, you gotta go. Wear and walking shoes, believe me. Yes, it's very it's steep. Not, and if you go during the patio, these incredibly athletic oh. Tuscan guys, they, the, the palio in Siena is with the horses, right? You run right. around. The palio in um, Montepulciano is they take full wine barrels and they're going up a hill like this and the first team that gets to the top of the next hill is the winner. Now, it's just like the palio in Siena. It doesn't mean you can't whip the guy next to you that's on the other team. Like, if you kick him and he's pulling his thing up and he falls down, that's okay. That's just however you get up there is fine. Oh my God. Anything, goes. Anything goes in Tuscany. You know it's deep. But most importantly, we were talking about this Tuscan hill town, right? So, Montepulciano is the name of the hill town. Vino nobile. Vino means wine. Nobile means noble, right? So then we go back to the feudal times in Tuscany. One thing you guys need to know is in Tuscany, everybody hates their neighbors. So the people oh, from, no. the people from <laughs> Montalcino hate the people from Florence. The people from Florence hate the people from Siena, and they all hate the people from Montepulciano. Oh my gosh. So, Vino Nobile di Montepulciano, yes, so this is true. If you go to Montepulciano, and I brought my daughters to this museum, there's a museum there, a medieval museum of torture. Okay, and this is all done in Baroque art. So you have an artist, a Baroque artist, depicting the things that they did to people in these times. It's not for everybody. Go there, like, go there, there no, don't go there before lunch. Go there after you've gone to the Enoteca and had a bunch of wine. And now you're like, okay, I don't know how much of this I can handle. So Montepulciano is a hill town, and they make Vino Nobile. And the reason why it's called Vino Nobile is because during these few medieval times, Siena, which is an agricultural province, was allied with Montalcino and all of the other farmlands around there. And they're in the south of Tuscany. Now the nobility was in Florence, so we're talking about the Medici family, the Gori family, the important families of Florence. That was the city-state in Italy that was one of the most powerful for many hundreds of years, right? So um, the Medici family, uh, was in charge of this whole area, and and so they decided that Montepulciano was a vantage point. They realized that from Montepulciano, they could see Siena, they could see all of the uh, farmlands in between there, so they allied with Montepulciano. So Vino Nobile di Montepulciano is the wine of the nobility of Florence. So that's how that wine was born. That's why they and it's a different, well, it's Sangiovese, which we were talking about before, is the same grape as Montepulciano, but it's a blend, just like Chianti is. So it's Sangiovese, the, the backbone is a grape called Canaiolo, okay? And that provides a structure behind the wine. And then you have local varietals like Colorino, Colorino, which is a local grape that provides color. And the most indigenous and rare grape is called Mamolo. Le mamole are these beautiful irises that bloom in the springtime in Tuscany, and it has a certain uh, uh, floral quality to it that this grape brings to the wine. So, as a very long-winded speech, Vino Nobile di Montepulciano is the wine of Florentine nobility, and it's typically a blend, and it's aged, meaning that they put the wine in oak for two to three years, depending upon. It's also a DOCG. I know you guys probably see on the wines like IGT, DOC, DOCG, and you're like, what is all of this? Does this make sense? It does. It's a pyramid, right? So the bottom of the pyramid is table wine, vino da tavola. Right above that, you have IGT, which is Indicazione Geografica Tipica, 
which means indication of geographic typicity. So, in this area, for example, Puglia, you grow Sangiovese, but it's not Montepulciano like in Tuscany, it's just simple Sangiovese. So this is an IGT wine. Once you get into a, an area with history, like, you know, for example, the Chianti Classico, then you go into DOC, Denomination of Controlled Origin, or Denominazione di Origine Controllata. That just means that there's a system of laws which has to do with the amount of acreage, the grapes you plant, how you age those uh, wines. So those are all the technical aspects of that. And when you get to the top of the pyramid, you're at Garantita, Denominazione di Origine Controllata Garantita. Denomination of controlled origin that's guaranteed. So if you're making a DOCG wine, like Vino Nobile, you make your wine, then you send it to uh, the state of Italy, they do chemical analysis, they do a lot of different tests to make sure that what you're selling is what it is. Because, uh, you know, Italians always have been known for cheating and they're very good at it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, it's not rare. <laughs> I'm sorry if I'm, if I'm, if I'm you know, my heritage, it is what it is. But, like, like I, I'm sitting here buying wines from these people and my dad's always teaching me, like, look, this is what's happening right now. You know, you realize that like, you're too focused, you're American, you're too like this, where all this is happening around here you're not paying attention to, you know? <laughs> so, um, and so that's kind of why this is an IGT. This comes from there. We were talking about Montepulciano and Vino Nobile, Montepulciano. So Vino Nobile is a DOCG. It's one of the most important wines of Italy, less known than Montalcino. My dad's from Montalcino, but I love Montepulciano. So, and those two are mortal enemies. People from Montepulciano and Montalcino hate each other, and they're between. It's like from here to downtown San Jose. That's how far we are, here, you know. And we hate each other. But, so I'm the American. They call me a lady. But you like the wine. I like the wine. So does your fa is your father mad at you because you like their wine? No, he's not at all. Like he's like me. He's like gray area. He's like I love all the wines from all the regions. I am the bastion of Italian culture. For being an Italian American, I do what I can to spread it the best and with the most uh, accurate uh, information as possible. You know, the people from Pisa, they hate them. To the coin, and they say it's better to have a debt in your house than somebody from Pisa at your door. <laughs> <laughs> and the same is it's meglio vedo morto in casa che un pisano la porta. <laughs> Uh, very simple, very quick. Uh, it's actually um, a, a, my version of an Irish dish. So probably about 10 years ago, it was St. Patrick's Day and it was uh, like a weekend and it was like, oh, why don't we put like three or four item, Irish item on the menu? Obviously we put corned beef and cabbage, I did uh, shepherd pie. But I was looking for an appetizer. So I started looking online and, and something like that came out with different ingredients and I put it more like on the Italian side. So I used Swiss cheese, prosciutto cotto, that is the ham here, and puff pastry with it. Very, very simple. Uh, asparagus uh, depends on the size of the asparagus. Right now they're not really in season, uh, so they're a little bit smaller. Um, if you add the bigger, bigger asparagus, you can peel the end. I usually use the medium size and cut it out. So like I say, I cut the asparagus about one third off. Uh, one third off. Uh, put it in hot boiling water. When you put it out for like 30, 40 seconds, put it out, put it in an ice bath. Uh, what happened when you put it in an ice bath, number one, they stop the cooking, so they're gonna be still a little bit crunchy, and they're gonna be really, really great. <laughs> Okay, depends on the size of asparagus. You can use one, two, three, four. Regular asparagus. Not, there's no season right now, so they're a little bit smaller. So what I usually do, I put a slice of ham on it. Then I put the cheese inside. You want to put the cheese inside the ham? Like that? So if you put the cheese outside, you're going to melt away. So I try to leave it inside. I put the asparagus at one end. And then you roll it. Don't drop this one, please. <laughs> Why, you're not hungry? <laughs> so then 
really up to you. There is no need. Some people put it too big so they don't go down. You just can put it with the last part on the table and then I move it. I grab a little bit of puff pastry. I cut it about a half inch strip. And then you wrap it. So what the egg, I use it to put a little bit on top of the puff pastry. You just give it a little golden color. Uh, yes, no, I mean it's really more like to put to put like the brown color. Usually they use it on pie a lot of a lot of time they put it on pie or to, to get the crust a little bit because uh puff pastry is powder and flour, there's nothing in it to get a color and it's to burn. <laughs> So you put a little bit on top, not too much. Put it in a sheet pan in the oven, 350, 375 for 10 to 15 minutes, depends upon my oven are very powerful, so a lot of time when I put a baking structure, the time change a lot. We use a conventional oven, a 375 is probably for 10 minutes uh, home, it's probably going to be a 400 for 15 minutes. So here again, keep an eye on it. <laughs> you just want the cheese to melt. You want, that, you want the puff pastry to rise and, and then grease, and obviously the cheese is going to melt. But it's going to stay inside because it's wrapped in the first one. Uh, these are very, very good hot. They're also really, really good cold. And I find out when we bake it, and I find out we, we always take twice of the amount because half of these guys come by and there's not price. <laughs> uh, so now we're moving out of uh, Puglia, which is the heel of the booth, and moving on to the island of Sardinia. Okay. So Monica, uh, so we talked about, first we talked about Friulano, Il Friulano. Il uh, Pino Grigio, Il Bellone, Il San Giovese, La Monica. Okay, La Barbera and La Monica are two of the only varietals that have a, a feminine, uh, I guess, a prefix. Yeah. Um, so this is a varietal that only grows on the southeastern side of the island of Sardinia and the northwestern side. This producer is in Sassari, which is the northwestern side of Sardinia. And Monica is a very low production. So, you know where the uh, in Costa Esmeralda is, where all yes. the, the right below there is Sassari and Oviedo, right? So that's the northwestern side of Sardinia. Um, I was mentioning earlier that this is the oldest land mass in Europe. Um, that is the island of Sardinia. Uh, older than the Alps, uh, older than the volcanoes in, in uh, Sicily and Vesuvius. Um, and this is a great, this is like a Pinot-like varietal. And what I was telling Humberto is in, in uh, Sardinia, they will chill this a little bit and have it with seafood as well. So it's a very, uh, it has a lot of versatility as far as like what you can pair it with. Um, and uh, it's also a superiore, so you can have Monica di Sardegna, and Monica di Sardegna superiore it has an extra year of age on it. So um, that, in a nutshell, is this indigenous grape, uh, also a mono varietal, so not a blended grape with other uh, wines, and uh, something that's indicative of there's not too many red grapes that are in Sardegna, so this is one of the primary grapes. And here come the uh, Imboldini. Rotoli. Rotoli. Okay, so we're going to start with the next one. Is that two, two different steps? I'm going to do the tomato sauce, the Sassari Pomodoro first, the uh, most popular here in the United States. They call it marinara. You're going to do that right now? Right, right now, yeah. Right. Uh, most popular, I can say, most popular here in the United States is called marinara. In Italy, really, marinara is actually not a tomato sauce. They call it marinara when you put anchovy. <laughs> so it's just almost exactly the same base, but they have anchovy in it. And a fun fact, uh, they have the pizza marinara, 
where it's just the dough with tomato sauce made it with uh, anchovy. And usually it's the cheapest pizza they have in the menu. I remember when we were kids, we were 13, 14 year old, go buy the pizza, we never had money, so we always ordered the marinara. And nobody liked it because we didn't have mozzarella. So but this was cheap. <laughs> so I'm going to do my tomato sauce. For all my tomato sauce, this is really up to whatever you like. I'm very basic. I wanted to keep the flavor of the tomato. Uh, so I only use garlic and onion. Some people use also carrots, celery, I or only garlic. I like the combination of garlic and onion because the garlic gives it a little bit of the extra bite on it and the onion gives the sweetness. Um, brand of tomato also very important. I've been using this brand for the last uh, it's called Alta Cucina. <laughs> I've been using this brand for the last 25 years. They promoted it. No, just kidding. <laughs> uh, I love it. Uh, the juicy side is a little bit thicker, it's not watery. The tomato are not super acid like most of the San Marzano that come from here in the same tomato. I blind taste this at least five times with 30 different chefs and all five times, all 13 chefs pick this. Uh, but you can only get that. Alright, thank you. What's the brand on that? Alta Cucina. Alta Cucina. Okay. So, the pen is a little bit too hot, so I put it on the side. Uh, so, another fun factor that I, I usually, when I cook, I use a mix of oil between canola and olive oil. Uh, main reason, olive oil, extra virgin olive oil, as you can see, have a very low heat, start smoke and beat around everything you cook with. When, when you mix it, I usually do uh, like 70, 30, 70% 70 canola oil, 30% olive oil, so you get still the flavor of the middle of the olive oil, but it doesn't smoke up and make the food a little bit. So we're gonna chop up the onion. I have the garlic, the whole garlic here. I'm gonna smash the garlic. And I'm gonna give it all. Another thing, for example, when I grew up cooking in Italy, garlic, very, very little. Uh, most of the time, actually, we smash it like that, roast it, and then pull it out. Just to leave the sauce. Just let the oil absorb the flavor and then pull it out. While here in the United more garlic better. Also, I'm Northern Italian. We don't use as much garlic, we use more the onion. <laughs> Southern Italian, they use mostly garlic. <laughs> I chop up my onion. I'm going to let the, the onion and the garlic run up a little bit. <laughs> restaurant Depot, I think you can still shop at Restaurant Depot now. Don't go on Friday because you're going to be there forever. <laughs> So, see, a lot of time, look at the consistency. They're whole tomato, but they, they have water inside. Roberto, where did you say you get the restaurant? A what? Where did you get the restaurant? Depot, you can get it at a restaurant depot. 
So now this point is totally up to you. When I cook the tomato sauce, I smash a little bit of tomato in my hand, but I like it to keep it very chunky. Uh, main reason, I don't want it to overcook or to over reduce. So what we usually do here or any restaurant I work at it, we cook it whole like that and then for uh, like 40 minutes on the cooking, we blend it a little bit and then let it reduce. Immersion blender, immersion blender, not too like too fine, but a little bit, so you get like, the pulp to dissolve and then reduce it down to the, the perfect So total, how much time would that be? Uh, it really depends on how much you cook. So, you know, if you okay. cook this, I mean, uh, if you're in a hurry, instead to use a pot like this, you want to use a saute pan, a flat pan. The reason that the, the tomato uh, cook quicker because it's flat, it's not that high. And it boils quicker, it reduces quicker. If you do that way, unfortunately, uh, there's going to be a lot of seeded in the tomato. So what you want to do, you just put a little bit of sugar in it, let it reduce it down, it will take the acidity away, and you got a sauce in that. So this part is one of the most important parts in, in a lot of cooking. A lot of people don't let cooking off the onion, so you got a very, very strong onion flavor, or very, very strong. They just put everything in. So why instead if you cook it and roast it and try to almost melt the onion to like a brown, not burn, but brown, yellow, dark yellow point, that's when you get the sweetness of the onion and the flavor. Uh, Otherwise, it's all wrong. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Huh? I, I'm a fan of high heat. I'm working in a restaurant for 35 years. I need to be fired. <laughs> uh, at the beginning, when it started, I like to roast my onion quick and fast. And then, and then once the, the sauce starts boiling, you lower it down and let it sit. Yeah, uh, give me a little bit more sweet, too sweet for maybe. Uh, I don't know, I, I'm happy with onion and garlic. <laughs> Some people put leeks in it too. I want, I want to do it fast, but I want to uh, show you guys the color that I wait until the garlic and the onion. So, Give me two more seconds, we get in there. Uh, also, same things when you do a risotto. Uh, a lot of people either don't put the onion or don't, don't roast the onion enough and you got a big chunk of flavor. Then on the risotto side, the other mistake a lot of people make, they don't toss, toast the rice, you know. So when you do a risotto, there is a completely different thing than this. When you put the rice, you roast the onion and put the rice in it, you want the rice to be really, really, really hot before you put any liquid. That hot, it is almost like you turn almost white. And when you put the wine to deglaze the pan, you want the wine to evaporate right away. You take the bitterness out of the one. We're getting there. So once we got that process, then we put in tomato sauce in it. I put a little, little, little salt to start with it. And then we're going to taste it later, a little pepper if you wanted to.
We're moving on the side there. I'm gonna wait until it starts boiling, and then I'm gonna lower the medium low heat. While we're cooking our tomato sauce, we're gonna start doing the pulpe. So, for example, my mother, uh, when I grew up, the pulpe that she made, they were only beef, and she would not put sauce in it. It was beef and uh, bread, uh, bread, old bread soaked in milk, garlic and parsley, and then she would shape it, instead of shape it around, she would shape it like a, a disc, like a pot, a hockey pot. Yeah. Then put a, put a little bit of bread crumb around, and then pan fry it, and then finish in the oven. That's it, that was, that was the pulpit. That's how I grew up with the pulpit. So like, the oven, she soaked the old bread? Correct, correct. So that's why I say polpette, like polpette, polpettone, bolognese, it was a way, especially for, especially for the core people, to recycle the food that, that either they took too much, or they, they, they shift out of meat, or whatever was around the bone that they couldn't, they couldn't pick it out and scrape it out. So that's, that's what they get out of this. Uh, I'm gonna skip it because we get it a little late. Very simple. I, here we do 50% beef, 50% Italian sausage. We mix it together. Usually it depends on the quantity of the meat. Uh, you have the recipe there. An egg, just to keep it, they're really gonna keep everything together. Bread crumb, if you want it, you don't have to. Uh, some people put uh, whole bread soaked on milk. Usually they make it a little bit more moisty. It also increases a lot the volume of the pulpette. <laughs> Uh, personally, I like the meaty flavor on it, so I only do ground beef and, uh, and sausage, eggs, bread crumb, and a little bit of parmesan cheese. Once you make the polpette, uh, there is two things you can do uh, to get to keep them the size or you make that you make, and also to keep them a little bit more juices, juice in the middle. We used to uh, uh, flash fry it, dust it with flour and flash fry it, like same things that I did with the shrimp, like sear them, so they keep the, the juice on the medium side. Uh, now I try to keep it a little bit more healthy. We don't put any flour in it, and I put the oven about a 500, 550. Put a little drizzle oil on top, and throw it in the oven for about 10, 15 minutes. When they start to get in a little brown inside, we dump the juice out, because it's mostly fat, and then we put it on the tomato. So, so let it simmer cover for about an hour, hour and a half. Enjoy. The Curvos, it's a, it's an Italian family, the Riboli family, and they own a uh, property called the San Antonio Winery. It's in Paso Robles. Uh, but this is a, a Pinot Noir from the Monterey Appalachian, but it's actually fruit from the Santa Lucia Highlands which is one of the best appellations for Pinot in California. Um, and it's just a simple label, San Simeon Pinot Noir. Um, and, uh, it, you know, if you want to get the technical side of it, like this Pinot Noir is made with French clones, so it's basically the, the graftings, the actual uh, the genetic code behind the French varietals, uh, whereas the Italian one is Pinot Nano, similar, but it's not the same. Um, and, uh, you know, I like it for, for me, uh, I think a lot of times California Pinot can be very inky and kind of really fruity and just over extracted and this one is kind of like a happy medium. Um, so, if you enjoy it and you like it, this is the San Simeon Pinot. That's yeah. in the Santa Lucia Highlands. Santa Lucia Highlands, yeah. Uh, okay, so that's on the ocean side or the city side? It's on the ocean side. So right as you go over the ocean, you'll still side there. It's right now because it's going to take about three and a half hours to cook. So. Yeah, wait. <laughs> so, uh, on the recipe and what you're going to eat tonight, it is wild boar. Um, we used to get it from California. Big company, chain supplier. Now, this one, it comes from Texas. Pretty good farm. We, we do exactly what they, they say in the recipe there, but also it can be substituted. Obviously, you don't like it. 
go buy wild or a safe way. You're not gonna find it. So the recipe you can use it with beef, you can use it with pork shoulder, you can use it really with any any kind of meat that is not like a ribeye steak. You don't wanna use a very expensive piece of meat. Uh, you can use a bear so make sure they have a quite a, a little bit of fat in it because otherwise you're gonna get really, really dry. So unfortunately when they made the board for you, they use all the board that I have in house and not gonna come until tomorrow. So I'm gonna do the same recipe, but I'm gonna do it with uh, uh, short ribs without bone. Okay, so same process. We're gonna start the pot right here. And on one side, I'm gonna start the base of the sauce, and on the other side, we're gonna sear the meat. <coughs> Same process again. Top pan. Canola oil. Little olive oil. On, on this case, remember how I chopped the onion very thin on the on the tomato sauce? On this case, I like my vegetable a little bit thicker. Two, two reasons. Number one, it's going to cook for a long, long time. So if you don't put the vegetables thick enough, they're going to mash up, and then you're not going to see anything in it, and it's going to be just a big blend of soup. Number two, you make a lot of more volume. <laughs> Wait, what did you say? You make a lot of more volume. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so we start the base. Uh, French is called Mirepoix. Celery, carrots, and onion. Okay, we got a fancy cup of over there. So same process here with the vegetable. You really wanted to cook them down to they get brown and they start a little bit transparent. Okay, I got the oil going right here. I'm gonna cut the meat. I'm going to season my meat with a little bit of salt and pepper. Yeah, but not the good way. And season a little bit. So once the meat is seared and the vegetables are almost brown, correct. Thank you. So now, cinghiale means wild boar. So now I'm going to pour out the extra oil. We're going to put the meat in here. And we're gonna mix the meat with the vegetable. And then at this point, we're gonna add the red wine. These are 
probably one of the most important process. When you add the wine, you don't want to add any more liquid until the wine evaporates at least halfway. Again, main reason, uh, the wine, if it's not cooked, it's gonna get that uh, bitterness to your meat, to your, to your stew. Then if you burn it out, if you burn out the alcohol, that will go away. Any particular red wine? Uh, no. I usually use cooking wine. We use burgundy in the kitchen. Burgundy. Either burgundy or something. Okay, just something. Not too strong. You don't want to use like a Zinfandel or, or like a big cup. You don't want to use an expensive bottle of wine to cook. Huh? Right. So once uh, the wine reduce, again I'm gonna st uh, step up, uh, take a quick step from it. Once the wine reduce, I'm gonna put a little seed and a little rosemary in it. <coughs> then you would add either chicken stock, beef stock, vegetable stock, it's really up to you what flavor you wanna give to the meat or what you're cooking. Obviously if you cook beef, don't put a lamb stock in it. If you cook pork, chicken stock is pretty basic. Uh, I use beef stock if I use cook beef. But you can also use chicken stock with it. Um, now, on this step, once the wine is completely evaporated, you wanna add the stock in it. And uh, pretty much try to cover the meat, but just barely cover the meat. Then, at this point, it's really up to you. You can either put in a very low fire on the stove, cover, but you gotta be cover, cover. The steam needs to stay inside. You can't put like a, a half pan or a cover that doesn't fit. Yeah. You need to be completely covered. That's the secret of braising, slow slow cooking, pot rum, whatever it's, you call it. I, I love braising, so we cook it completely covered with foil. I cook it in the oven. At home, in Italy, my mom used to cook it on the stove. But really need to be very sealed so the, the, the vapor don't go, away, go up and then keep going down and simmer slowly, evaporate very, very, very slowly. Low temperature for a long, long time. Uh, my cousin used to have, have a restaurant in Italy. You used to, before you go home, put a pot on the stove and then go home and the next morning and put it down. Wow. Did any no, no, because you put it like a little bit, of very, very light yeah. fire. In it. Like cooking menudo. Plus it was, yeah, plus it was a big pot, as long as you don't fill it up all the way. <laughs> in the morning you was so wrong. You give about two, three hours, depends how big you cut the meat. I usually go, in this case, because we're gonna serve a couple of buscetta, but it may a little bit smaller because you don't want a chunk to be too big. Um, we grill the bread on the grill. Uh, then at this point, it's totally up to you. I, where I come from, we don't do it. In Tuscany, the most popular things is after the, the bread come out of the grill, they rub the garlic on it. Yeah, that's what I did with this. And then they put whatever, the tomato and this guy, the, the wild boar. We finish it with a little bit of Parmesan cheese and a touch of truffle oil. Thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate it. Hope you guys can come out. Our board is coming up right now. Thank you again. I'll see you next week. Okay. Last wine. Last wine. The wine you didn't get. I know. Oh, lovely. The last wine we're going to taste tonight is uh, Carignano del Sul Cheese. So Carignano is the same grape as Carignan, which they grow in France. Uh, this wine comes from Sardinia. It's an island called Sant'Antioco. So Sant'Antioco is off the southwestern side of Sardinia, so completely opposite where the Monica is from. And this is a wine that they typically pair with wild boar, because Carignan goes with game. Um, Sardinia is known for their wild boar and pecorino, so that's typically their, 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 their pairing with this wine. Um, 
An interesting note is the island of Sant'Antioco used to be connected to the country, to the, to the island, and then the isthmus fell down. So in Roman times, you could walk across to the island of Sant'Antioco. And I've been here, the actual uh, vines are in sand. So you're literally like, you know, 200 uh, meters, which is like 600 feet away from the sea. And these vines are not growing in soil, they're growing in white sand. Uh, in some particular to these vines, these vines, I don't know if you guys ever heard of, uh, hey, hey, hey. there was a, there was a, a big, and it's still a problem now, called phylloxera, and phylloxera destroys vines, it happened in Europe twice, it happened here in California in the 80s, and what they found out is that American rootstock, so American vines that are actually like St. Croix, there's a lot of native American vines that were in this country, and they're resistant to phylloxera. The phylloxera is like a microscopic louse that moves through the water table and eats the vines out. The reason why I'm bringing this up is because this wine is in sand, and so they never had to graft the vines over on American rootstock. So you're getting a basically a Carignano that is from the original rootstock that's genetically identical to the grape bridal. It's pretty simple, like the memory in a grapevine in itself is not in the roots, it's in the actual, the, 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 the vine, the part that you see, the part underground doesn't matter. So, well it does matter. What they can do is they can take the rootstock of an American vine and inject the actual, uh, Kind of like you make pear apples, you're actually playing with the genetics of a pear and an apple and making the same. Same thing you can do with a vine. The only reason why I bring this up is because this is a wine that's made with European rootstock and it has a little bit of a different flavor. In uh, France or in California, it's called pied de terre. So it means the foot, the, the, the rootstock is original. Well, I hope everybody enjoyed the beautiful day.